Try yeah, now. The same screen. <laughs> this is you... exactly what I didn't want to have happen. And I saw it click over, so try clicking it now. See if that works. What'd you do? Yay! I don't know, but it worked. Yay! <laughs> All right. So, oh, thank goodness. Here's what we're going to be talking about. Um, we're going to be touching on this concept of body hacking. It's kind of a new um, term. We'll be talking about body positivity, about um, assumptions around weight and obesity, the science of weight. Um, we'll talk about body dissatisfaction and the role that plays. And then this um, sort of dilemma between body acceptance versus self-improvement and how do those two fit together and um, strategies for improving body compassion, which I want to propose is the way out of the dilemma. So this concept of body hacking, um, or it's also called biohacking. I'm having to move you guys away so I can see my screen. Okay. Um, so it's, the, it's a do-it-yourself biology, uh, the art and science of changing the environment around you and inside you so that you feel in control over your body. Everybody wants that, right? Typically, it's outside the realm of traditional medicine, but not always. Um, it's manipulating the human body as a system, like a traditional hacker would manipulate a computer to cause the system to behave in a way that it was not originally intended. Um, however, there are forms of body hacking that we appreciate. For instance, um, a pacemaker. People who are in wheelchairs um, can have an implant in their hand that opens doors for them. So it's not that the whole field is a problem. It's when this type of um, te technology is used in certain ways that it's a problem that I want to address. So some of the um, components are that you don't accept your body's limitation. You push to your maximum potential. A lot of gyms sort of have that um, orientation. Push, 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 one more, one more, one more. And it's, it's characterized by rigidity. So let's say that you're applying this philosophy to exercise and you miss a day of exercise, then that would be a problem in this philosophy. Um, here's some other examples of body hacking practices. Um, so wearables that track your mood or your physical activity or your diet, implants in the body, I've already mentioned those, um, and some of them are helpful. Cryotherapy, um, neurofeedback, that can be very helpful to learn to regulate brain waves, especially for people who have ADHD or have anxiety. Um, and then so on. But it's those last two where it overlaps um, what I'm talking about with extreme dieting and extreme exercise. I think this is an example of early biohacking, not this picture. Han Solo, one of my favorite characters of all time. 1977, this is what the action figure looks like. 2010, same toy company, right? That looks like a hacked body for sure. So this is what people in 2010 were given their eight-year-olds to play with. Another um, realm where something good goes too far is, um, is, is in a, a diagnosis, although it's not yet in the DSM, called orthorexia. This term was coined by Stephen Bradman. He was a holistic um, MD and in 1996. He coined the term to, um, to refer to some of his clients and patients. Um, he, he, did, um, he, he made up the term orthorexia to, because ortho means correct. And he started out by just teasing his patients that they were trying too hard to eat too perfectly. And he would say, you're being orthorexic. But as he continued to work with people and focus on this uh, phenomenon, he became more and more concerned. And he has been writing about it um, since, since then and trying, um, doing research and trying to get this to become a diagnosis. Um, it's different from anorexia, but it looks very similar. 
So it's an intense focus on eating pure or healthy foods only. Um, that is certainly very, very common in our society right now. I think a lot of my, um, my neighbors who I love and spend a lot of time with actually are borderline um, orthorexic. Uh, decreasing variety in foods allowed, increasing levels of stress experienced regarding, regarding foods eaten, so that rigidity um, around diet is in here usually driven by quality of foods versus quantity. So this is where it's a little different from anorexia. It's not necessarily somebody trying to eat less, but it's more about um, how perfect or clean or pure the food is. So the person may choose to go without food instead of eating foods viewed as unhealthy or processed. So weight loss can definitely be um, a component. The obsessiveness, um, and it's different from anorexia because it's not typically focused on being thin and there's not body image distortion. So people with orthorexia see themselves as too thin, but they can't do anything about it. So self-test for orthorexia, I stuck this in here because I do think that this is so common in our, um, in our society, in our everyday lives right now. So I'd encourage you to read through this, think about yourself or maybe someone that you know or you're working with and um, use this as a guide. So I'll just read it. Do you ever wish you could stop thinking so much about food and spend more time thinking about your loved ones, etc.? Are you constantly questioning food and considering how foods are unhealthy for you? Do you feel guilt or shame when you stray from your perfect diet? Does it seem physically impossible to eat a meal prepared by someone other than yourself, like restaurants? Do you feel in control when you stick to your planned and healthy diet? And do you look down on others who eat less healthfully than you? So is this the pursuit of health or a pursuit of control? Um, going back to the concept of body hacking, this man, Thomas Stackpole, he is the senior editor at, Bo at Boston Magazine, um, which is part of the New York Times. And he wrote about his own experience with body hacking. And these were his conclusions. If this started out about weight at some point for me, these obsessions stopped being about my body, the strain of a new fitness regimen, a new mania, lifting or raw food, those things became its own draw. So how well he was able to perform at whatever he was focused on in the moment became the reinforcer. He also wrote, when someone attempts to find a sense of worth by controlling their body, they find themselves in a never ending process of jumping from one fix to another. <clears throat> Self-improvement efforts are fine, but if they are your primary source of control and a sense of well-being and worth, they're doomed to failure. So he recommended going back to being moderate and normal in his eating and his exercise. So is it wrong to strive for a sense of health? Is it wrong to strive for a sense of control? That is a dilemma that we'll be sort of um, touching on throughout the rest of the presentation. Okay, I don't know why I had to hit the arrow key three times, but it worked. Um, History of the body positivity moment, movement. So we're changing gears here and we're going to another, a, a very different philosophy, body positivity. Um, Clarity Fitness is based on this approach. And um, let me tell you a little more about it. So the history is uh, the first evidence of something like the body positivity movement was in the 1850s to the 1890s, the Victorian dress reform movement where um, people started saying we shouldn't need to wear corsets. We are good enough as we are. Um, in the 1960s, the National Association to Advance Bad Acceptance began. And there have been several things that have grown out of that association. Um, the Health at Every Size movement with Linda Bacon, I'm gonna talk a lot more about that. Um, led to the body positivity movement in its more current form 
Um, examples of that are the Yoga for Round Bodies, the Dove Real Beauty campaign, um, social media campaigns such as Tess Holiday, who is a larger size model, um, at F Your Beauty Standards. And then 2016, Mattel, same toy company, by the way, that I was showing you, uh, San, Han Solo um, images, released a new line of Barbie dolls. And if you can see that image, they, were called, they are called fashionistas and they're in three different body shapes. So that's good. So the philosophy behind body positivity is that people deserve to have a positive body image regardless of how society is viewing their bodies um, and popular culture view of the ideal shape, size and appearance. Because we know that the popular culture view has changed over time. Um, there have been times in our past where a curvy body was considered much more um, attractive, I guess. And then the opposite has also been true. And, um, and then the body hacking movement, one could say that things like um, dieting to, a, to be underweight and then using implants, such as breast implants, would fit into that category. Um, that's a body shape that doesn't really occur that much in nature. The really thin person with large breasts. Um, so what are their goals? Challenging how society views the body. Challenging that there's one particular type of body that we should all be striving for. Addressing unrealistic body standards. Promoting the acceptance of all bodies. And helping people build confidence and acceptance of their own body. So what is the perfect body? This image came from the Dove um, movement. The perfect body is yours. And your body might change shape at different times. There may be a time when you, um, you are building a company and you don't have time to exercise and that affects your body. There may be a time when you're growing a baby in your body and that changes your body. Menopause might change your body. There may be a time when you have a lot of extra time and find pleasure in exercising more often. That changes your body. Somewhat. Somewhat. But these are all just different versions of your perfect body. So why does this continue 25 years after I learned about metabolism to still be such a confusing area? Well, I hate to tell you as a psychologist that some of this can be traced back to John B. Watson, who is a psychologist. He is considered the father of modern advertising. His um, philosophy, you're not good enough, but this product will fix it, shows up in just about all modern advertising now. So he was fired from his academic post at Johns Hopkins, um, in part due to his academic work on conditioning children, but also uh, for some, some, something around a scandalous divorce. Um, after being fired from his academic post, he began research on advertising and concluded that marketing depended not on appealing to rational thought, here are the reasons why this product will work for you, but instead appealing to emotions and stimulating desire for the product. And this quote, uh, uh, okay, it's turning out that I cannot, um, look at my PowerPoint and also read the chat. So I'm sorry, I'm probably gonna have to just take questions at the end. And I do have time to hang around for a little while and take questions. I'm just not quite that coordinated and it's taking up my screen right now. So back to the quote, tell him something that will tie him up with fear. That's you by the way, something that will stir up a mild rage that will call out an affectionate or love response or strike at a deep psychological need. And then you can sell your product. So here's another example of, um, of what marketing can do. So here is half of an image of a person um, who I think looks very attractive. Pretty eyes, high cheekbones, but she's not good enough. So this is what we can do for her. 
we can um, fix your hair, put on makeup. Looks like it's kind of a before and after of makeup. But guess what? It's way more than that. So if you will look closely at this image, check out where her jawline is. Notice her shoulders. They did more than just put makeup and hair. I hope you can see that in the image. They made her eyes much bigger, her lips much bigger, her neck much longer. So let's look at another self-test. True or false? And what I'd like for you to do is if you're like most people, you, are, you will absolutely say true to a few of these things. And um, I'm going to tell you that I'm gonna to try to make a case for the fact that none of these are true, um, but they are commonly believed. So weight is basically a factor of calories in, calories out, true or false. Obesity causes health problems and shortens life expectancy. Heavier people eat more than thin people. The best way for heavy people to improve health is to lose weight. BMI, body mass index, is an accurate health measure. That's basically height and weight. Anyone who's determined can lose weight and keep it off through appropriate diet and exercise. The pursuit of weight loss is a practical and positive goal. The best way to increase metabolism is through exercise. The most important variable for weight loss is willpower. People who are obese have a problem with motivation or eat for emotional, emotional reasons. So if you're honest, you probably said yes to some of those. I have too. Turns out that's not what science tells us. So let's take a look. First of all, can you tell if someone is healthy by looking at them? Let's look at these images. So you have a person at the top left. She's in a larger body and she is doing aerobic exercise. So she may have a very healthy heart. You see the person on the right who is um, a, a, a muscle builder who may have a very weak heart. You don't know, but we do find that excessive muscle building has been very um, hurtful on the heart, strengthful on the heart for some people. Um, and larger people can be very aerobically fit. Let's look at the bottom left picture. Here's a person who's competing in an activity that probably requires a weight um, category. And we know that people in those kinds of competitions tend to um, try to lose weight so that they can be more cut and fit the weight category right before competition. Um, repetitive increasing and decreasing weight can be very stressful on the heart. And the purple person on the right may have, may be very fit. So you can't tell by looking at someone whether they're fit or not. There are assessments for that, but your eyes is not one of them. So I mentioned health at every size earlier, um, a movement that was started by Linda Bacon, and she has done a lot of research and she has reviewed um, the science behind weight um, and food and movement um, extensively. And she's written a book called Body Respect. And I'm gonna be pulling information from that book as well as some other sources. Um, the Health at Every Size movement. <clears throat> Gotta move y'all a little bit more. Pretty soon I won't be able to see even half of your face. Okay. Um, uh oh, I think I did something there. I didn't mean to do. Okay, I'm trying to go back a slide and my arrows aren't working again. Breathe, we've all had trouble with Zoom the last few weeks. You're fine, Linda. Thank you. You're doing great. <laughs> um, I don't know if I should just keep thinking the magic's gonna occur in a minute and it's gonna go back because that was kind of an important slide. What about the arrows at the bottom of your, uh, the red bar where it says slide 21 through 47, all the way at the right, there's an arrow that points to the left and an arrow that points to the right. If you hit the left, that might be your back one. Or maybe not. I see that. Oh, oh yay. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Who was that? Brilliant. That's LeVar. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> All right. Um, so, the, the, uh, the health, health at every size is a movement trying to shift the paradigm from focusing on weight to focusing on health. So they encourage body acceptance as opposed to weight loss or weight maintenance. Support reliance on internal regulatory processes such as hunger and satiety as opposed to encouraging cognitively imposed dietary restriction. Back in the 80s, I read one of the first definitions I ever read about um, what an eating disorder it was when you take a biological function and put it under cognitive control. Um, they support active embodiment. Movement is good for our bodies as opposed to encouraging structured exercise and supports ending the focus on weight as an indication of health. The number, the size is not an indication of health. Fitness is, so toward the assessment of fitness, not the number. Some negative consequences of the current perspectives. Back to if you said yes to any of those questions on that self-test. The current perspective leads to eating disorders. Um, it is a natural consequence of dieting to binge. I'm going to talk a little more about that in a few minutes too. It encourages discrimination based on weight. If you think back to one of the um, uh, questions, uh, if people just had willpower, they um, wouldn't be larger. So that is a judgment. Um, dieting is related to increased cortisol production. This is so important. So dieting is actually stressful on the body. If you think about it, the body is, runs on fuel. And so if there's not enough fuel, then the body does certain things to um, help you make it until there's available fuel, food. One of the things it does is it increases cortisol. And I'm sure you've heard in other contexts and probably here too, that cortisol is so bad for your body, bad for your heart. Um, and you don't have to be anxious or stressed about current stressors in your life for hunger to produce the same cortisol that is, it produced, that is produced under other kinds of stress. Diets fail, which leads to weight cycling, like m multiple attempts um, at the same thing. And um, we're gonna talk about the dangers in weight cycling. Yo-yo dieting, well, here we are. <laughs> Yo-yo dieting causes stress on the heart, hypertension, insulin resistance, and dyslipidemia. Um, and that's, a, that's when you have um, a, a disproportion in your good versus your bad cholesterol in the wrong direction when you want it. And then these studies, there's several studies here. Um, weight cycling can account for all the excess mortality associated with obesity. So I'm going to talk a little more about that, but that's really an important statement. So it's not the fat on the body that causes mortality. It is the attempts at getting rid of the fat. It is the weight cycling that is so stressful on the body. Excessive exercise can also lead to heart problems. So one of the myths is that obesity causes health problems. Well, it is true that obesity, obesity is associated to health problems, but there's no evidence of causality. So I'm not gonna go through all the studies. I have several slides here with lots of studies. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just kind of pick and choose. But in the red boxes or rust colored boxes are the conclusions of all these studies. And then you can go and research um, on your own if you want to. So um, what this slide is referring to is that in these studies, if they looked at something other than the number of weight, if they looked at fitness, level of activity, quality of nutrition, that explained the health. If they looked at weight cycling, life stress, or socioeconomic status, that explained lack of health, like other problems like um, cholesterol, diabetes, heart, blood pressure. It wasn't the number. Therefore, 
um, what we need to do is look at these, these factors rather than the number. Okay, you probably can tell by my expression that that didn't advance again. So I'm going to try this other way. I think it's the other arrow because you want to go forward now. Yeah, that's going to take you back. The other arrow to your right will take you uh, forward. A little one like that. Yep. I see it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh oh, bear with me. I got to close the chat box again. Oh. So, so I can see the, um, those arrows you're talking about. All right, let's see. So I want to go that way. So can someone who is obese be healthy? Um, yes. Someone who's in a larger body that, met, that even fits the criteria for obesity as it currently stands can definitely be healthy, can be fit, can be absent of any medical conditions. Um, so they, one, this first study is an example. They looked at insulin, insulin sensitivity in blood lipids, um, how they changed when people began um, exercise movement. And even in people who gained weight during the um, process, the movement is what um, brought their numbers down. The death rate for women and men who are thin but unfit is at least twice as high as their larger counterpoints who are fit. I think that's important. Um, BMI profiling overlooks 16 million normal weight individuals who are not healthy but identifies 55 million overweight people who are not ill. And believe me, they get the attention of their doctors. So conclusion, look at specific health indices versus weight as a target for intervention if someone does have health concerns. Could health risks, could health risks associated with being larger or obesity be a result of body dissatisfaction rather than vice versa. So most of us think people have body dissatisfaction because their body um, is larger, but that's not at all true. I've known people at every weight who had intense body dissatisfaction. And um, so let's, let's dig into that just a bit. People who are larger um, do suffer, sometimes prejudice, teasing, bullying, most larger teens have experienced shame. And it turns out that that kind of experience leads to intense stress, increased cortisol secretion, isolation, fear of being seen, exercising, depression, even suicide. And the, all these consequences can le lead to weight gain regardless of how much food you eat. Now there's an interesting point. So cortisol causes people to increase weight. Um, not exercising might. Depression, especially if someone has to take medication, some of those medications can. So back to that question about um, is weight a factor of calories in, calories out? That's one factor, but there's so many other factors as well. Um, and this last study, 170,000 adults were asked their actual weight and then what they perceived as their ideal weight. And what they found is that those who had a larger gap, in other words, were more dissatisfied with their bodies, actually were less healthy, regardless of their weight. So body dissatisfaction seems to be much more important than weight. So if we could change some of the attitude around body dissatisfaction, around weight, we might be able to actually help. So what are the negative consequences of yo-yo dieting or weight cycling? Well, first of all, it is true that 80 to 90% of diets fail. They work at first, but long-term they fail. But that leads to weight cycling because most people just try again. It also leads to an awful lot of money going into that industry. So there was a study on hypertension in 99 that showed that obese women who had dieted had high blood pressure, while those who had never been on a diet had normal blood pressure. Does that make you stop and pause? It did me. 
So chronic inflammation, insulin resistance, and cardiovascular disease are all common problems with people whose weight goes up and down. It is much healthier, as this study and others have shown, to, have, to be in a larger body consistently than to continue trying to uh, maybe fight nature and go up and down. So does diet, exercise, and determination result in long-term weight loss? I think you already know what I'm gonna say here. So there's just a bunch of studies here that keep saying the same thing, that it doesn't work that way. I don't think I'm gonna go into all of them. I do wanna, um, since I haven't, since I've been mainly talking about diet and exercise, I wanna jump down to the second to the bottom one, the bariatric surgery. So even with surgery, oh, that's a body hack. Um, weight loss peaks about one year post-operative. So for about a year, weight drops, after which gradual re weight regain is, norm, is the norm. That certainly has been my experience with people I've known who've had the surgery, is that even that is not a long-term fix. For a minute there, I thought we weren't gonna have a conclusion. <laughs> so here's the conclusion of all of that. We're not nearly finished, but this is the conclusion of the research. Traditional, traditional weight loss strategies are effective, but not as you might think. They work in the short run, but in the long run, they actually cause weight gain. Why? Well, factors that affect weight loss and weight gain. One is genetics, that's the most important one. Everybody is different height, everybody has different size noses, different eye color, different bone structure, and different weight. And weight exists like every other characteristic on a bell curve. And unfortunately in our society, if you know what a bell curve is, we, are, we look at just a very narrow part of the bell as acceptable. So genetics and trying to change your genetics, trying to body hack your genetics, doesn't work. So genes play a big role and um, as well as um, we are genetically different in our responses to exercise. Some people exercise and never build much muscle. Some people exercise and build muscle very easily. And um, some people as they exercise, their body gets amazingly efficient in storing calories. They would have the body to be admired back in days when maybe you had to um, chase the mammoth for food because their body worked efficiently, but we um, don't appreciate that quality anymore in our society. Um, other reasons for gaining weight stress, we talked about medications and weight loss. And I think I've already talked about that. I may talk about that a little more, but um, anytime you do weight, lose weight, it actually triggers hormones to fight weight loss because your body doesn't think that's a good idea. Why would, why would anybody be doing that, it thinks? And so there's all kinds of counter mechanisms to fight weight loss. So failing to lose weight long-term is a sign of the success of your internal weight regulation. So diet failure is no more a sign of gluttony or lack of character than breathing deeply after exertion. You have to breathe deeply after, you ex after you've um, exercised heavily because that's what the body does. And slowing down metabolism when you diet is what the body does. So let's, let's talk about um, a metaphor that I like to use and that is considering a deer who's in a snowstorm. And let's talk for a minute about what happens to the deer when can't find food because of the ice or snow. All of these things happen to us as well. There's increased a production of adrenaline and cortisol. That's good because that gives the deer a little extra energy to keep searching for food rather than to lay down in fatigue. Um, chronic adrenaline or, and cortisol is not good for us, but um, in the short run, run it's very helpful difficulty sleeping because of the adrenaline, selective attention. That deer is not gonna be paying any attention to other deer. In fact, even if there is other deer, that's just um, competition for food. 
So social isolation, not being interested in um, mating. Obsessiveness, the deer should not really be thinking about anything but food. So when we diet, that tends to happen to us cognitively as well. Um, I already mentioned decrease in social interest and then binging. So if the deer comes finally upon a bush that has thawed and is covered in berries, do you think that that deer is going to eat one serving? No, the, binge will, the deer will binge. And binging does occur naturally in nature after times of deprivation, as it does in the human body as well. But most of us consider the binge as something to be highly ashamed of, even though it's a natural response to dieting. So in humans though, we depart from the deer. We um, tend to continue um, the cycle with possibly purging in some form, feeling guilty about the binge, um, dehydration, muscle breakdown, irritability from the adrenaline and the cortisol, and then weight cycling. So decreased caloric intake leads to weight gain in 80, 90, 80 to 90 percent of the dieters and this is just a repeat of what I've been saying so I'm not going to go over it but it's a nice visual if you want want to have that so the summary is that healthy weight exists on a continuum those who are on the higher end of the continuum are likely to feel shame and be shamed in our current cultural climate the pursuit of thinness is so extreme that even normal weight individuals may experience body dissatisfaction from a very early age and body dissatisfaction can lead to many negative consequences, including weight gain for both biological and behavioral mechanisms. So what is the way out? Now we get to the fun stuff. So um, another study um, about, um, this was in the University of Lisbon and Bangor University um, coordinated efforts and they, um, had a bunch of people, I don't see the number, but it was a large number of people that they um, divided into two groups, a control group and, um, and then the experimental group. And the control group was given traditional information regarding weight loss. And that would be the stuff you would expect. Uh, creating healthy information about creating healthy eating habits, exercise habits, how to control stress, and understanding nutrition. Doesn't sound bad. However, the other group, met once a week and explored body image, how they felt about their body. They explored the history of their body image, you know, when it began, um, their own personal barriers to weight loss, like what they thought it was, and their preoccupation with physical appearance. Um, tr trying to go toward body acceptance rather than the preoccupation. And what they found is that both groups did benefit uh, however, the body image intervention group saw the stronger results. Um, both groups lost some weight, um, but the control group, it was more of a permanent effect. So research shows improving body imaging and compassion leads to weight loss. Now, all of our other attempts tend to result in body dissatisfaction doesn't seem to be the way we should go. So here are some more, um, just some more studies that say about similar things. They're there for you to look at, but I'm gonna go on to um, this concept. So is it okay to accept your body as it is and also want to improve it? Well, that's a dialectic. And anybody who knows me or works with me or reads my um, stuff, Knows I love dialectics. Dialectics are when two things that seem opposing um, exist as truth in the same moment. So yes, somehow you can um, have body acceptance and also want to improve. It's the actually the underpinning of all psychotherapy is that you accept yourself in order to change. Um, but the motivation has to be pointed in the right direction. So you can accept that Self and others' weight is a result of many factors. Acceptance of the natural shape that genetics has given you or others. And, and then still um, want to improve, but the improvement needs to be motivated by a desire for health in yourself or others, measured by health criteria, not, criteria, not weight. 
and efforts at improvement are always enhanced through compassion towards self, not dissatisfaction. All right, um, don't let your mind bully your body. Our minds have been taught to bully our bodies, I think, in our current um, culture. So, but compassion's the way to go, even physiologically. And again, because of time, I'm not gonna go through all this. And um, I will point out one point that I haven't made yet, positive thoughts have been demonstrated to produce dopamine. And we know dopamine gives us energy. We need compassion um, rather than stress in our, in the way we feel toward ourselves. So what is body compassion? Well, the earliest working definition comes from bodycompassion.com and it is the regarding of one's own body and appearance, competence, and health with mindfulness, kindness, and aware of common humanity. Body compassion encourages a shift in view of the body from one of judgment to one of compassion. All right. So um, I actually, this comes from um, a workshop I went to called Body Embrace to the Amber Paris and Mary Elizabeth, um, where they broke down compassion into three parts because some people can't jump straight to self-love. They've been disliking their body for too long and they just can't look in the mirror and love themselves. So we break it down um, into body tolerance, acceptance, and then compassion. To be yourself, everyone else is already taken. Improving tolerance. So I'm going to now go through some strategies that um, can be helpful in uh, this endeavor that I'm talking about using body positivity and body compassion as you move through life. Um, so at first, if you are in a state of real self-loathing, then these are the kinds of things you can do that are more about just stopping, stopping the hating, stopping the negativity. So there are things like just distracting yourself from the, from the thought, doing other kinds of self-soothing, self-care, any kind of mindfulness breath work, a mindful progressive body scan. So that's not about body image because the idea is this is tolerating, not really to acceptance yet, but just scanning your body from head to toe, maybe to see where you feel tension or where you feel like you're comfortable. Um, and then beginning to build curiosity about um, many of the things I've been talking about, including what your natural body size is, where would nature take you, and then grounding statements. What is the most reassuring thing you could say to yourself in this process? And then strategies for uh, improving body acceptance, beginning with the mirror um, and being grateful. So the first thing with acceptance is to be grateful for what your body does do for you. Maybe looking at your eyes, I can see. Look, looking at my ears, I can hear. Looking at my arms, I can reach and hug. Um, movement for enjoyment and empowerment rather than, and inner health factors rather than changing your appearance. Um, the fusion skills, that means when the old uh, critical thoughts come up, you sort of say, okay, I hear you, but you turn your mind to uh, an acceptance thought. Um, the miracle question, well, if I woke up tomorrow and I felt just fine with my body, well, what would tomorrow be like? And how would it be different? And how can I go ahead and start that now? Acting as if, the first time I ever did a therapy session, I acted as if I was someone a lot older than me and a lot more experienced than I got through the session. So it's perfectly okay to act as if, if it's in line with your values and goals, not if it's just to please other people. Half smile, this is my favorite DBT exercise in the, in the whole DBT world. Half smile is putting on a um, sort of uh, just a half smile, like a Mona Lisa smile. It's not a big grin and it works to trigger from your brain thoughts that match the smile. So most of us know that when we have a negative thought, our face matches the thought but we don't often realize that the, uh, it works just in reverse as well, that if you change your facial expression, it will actually trigger different kinds of thoughts. So putting on a half smile and looking in your eyes in the mirror, you may be able to actually, actually feel some affection towards yourself. 
I used this when my kids were little all the time to keep from yelling and still use it with my husband and I won't tell you the different ways I have to use it with him. That's another conversation. Um, turn mind to positive qualities to separate self-worth from appearance. Acknowledging all the other things that are unique and wonderful about you. Setting daily intentions. Maybe I'm going to catch myself every time I say something unkind to myself. Using external prompts to do that. Um, three by five cards or sticky post-its in strategic places. Three minute mindfulness activity. If you would get up every day and do three minutes dwelling on a thought that you wish you had more often, you would because you're putting it on the forefront of your brain, which is your prefrontal lobes, and that's where the, the change occurs. So spending three minutes just dwelling on a thought that would be good for you can make, it can be life-changing. Um, and mindful eating. I'm not gonna do a um, workshop on mindful eating right now. I think a lot of people probably have a good idea what that's about. <laughs> probably less people actually do it. So focusing on mindful eating, really tasting and slowing down and appreciating and being grateful for the food. And then um, practicing body compassion. So this is the ability to experience compassion and appreciation for your body. It could even include loving your body. Um, that would be where we all wanna go, but uh, none of us are going to live there, I don't think, 24-7. You could have a bad hair day, um, So, but at least practice compassion. Compassion is a practice. It's an action. It's a verb. It's the way you are towards yourself. And back to mirror work, actually looking in the mirror and saying compassionate things to you about your body. Um, so I love that my eyes um, allow me to see. I love that my eyes are the shape they are. They've been with me since I was born. Those kinds of compassionate um, statements in the mirror. Affectionate breathing. So as you're breathing in, actually saying things of affection towards yourself. I have to do it there for a second. Self-compassion body scan and meditation. So it's another body scan closing your eyes and just going through your body, but this time going through and imagining, visualizing each part of your body with compassion and appreciation. Writing a letter to your body, maybe it would be good to ask some forgiveness for some of the ways that you've treated your body in the past or felt toward it. Um, mirror work with compassion body scan. Okay, that's just a repeat, sorry about that. Thought stopping. Um, is a cognitive technique that when you notice one of the old thoughts popping in or something eliciting them, then you uh, just replace it just as quickly as you can. You say no in your mind and you replace it with a compassionate thought. Setting intentions for the day that are compassionate. And then a loving kindness meditation. May I be safe, peaceful, and kind to myself and may I accept myself as I am today. All right, we are on the last topic. And as I said before, it looks like we have four minutes left in the first hour scheduled, but I'm gonna hang around for questions. Um, we have um, plenty of time afterwards for anybody who wants to hang out, but I will finish the content by five o'clock. So here's a warning. I'm about to control what you're thinking about. I did. And you know what? That happens to you all the time and it's called priming. So, um, a little bit of the history of priming, and this comes from a book that you can see there. Um, one of the first studied effects of priming was when, back in the 70s, McDonald's decided to tell pe ask people at the window, would you like fries with that? Of course, now that's a very, um, uh, that's what they all do, uh, but their um, sales of fries, french fries, went up. Um, dramatically by asking that one question because they primed people to think that they wanted french fries. Um, there's been a study done where they actually primed people to walk more slow or more slowly. Um, they gave people several words to make a sentence out of, excuse me, and one group, um, the words kind of lent themselves to a sentence around uh, being older, and the other group it was about a spring day or something like that. And then they timed the people 
uh, as they left the experimental room to the, in, to the um, exit the building. And those that had been given the words about aging walked more slowly. They had no idea that they had been affected by the research in that way. So the idea is that we're all being primed all the time. Why don't we take that ability and use it in our own behalf? Um, and that would look like a preferred dominant thought. So it's a type of affirmation, but it's unique. It's a positive action, so it's a verb, that is worded in present tense, not what I wish for in the future. It's something I can do now. And it focuses on small changes that can be personally controlled. The idea is that when you word it correctly to yourself or in this way to yourself, it turns your mind in that direction. Your mind will follow the direction of the words. Just like the car follows the direction of our head, your mind follows the direction of your words. And then it will associate to other times when you said those words. So let's say that you want to be less concerned about how others view you. Or I want to be less anxious. When you say the words anxious or how people view me, you're, that triggers in your mind to think at times when you felt anxious about how people were viewing you. And that's not really helpful. What is more helpful is to say, I walk with confidence and greet people warmly. That will trigger in your mind times when you've actually done that. And then you're much more likely to repeat it. All right. Live Well Pledge by Lindo Bacon. Today I will try to feed myself when I'm hungry. I will be attentive to how foods taste and make me feel. I will try to choose foods I like that make me feel good. I will try to honor my body's signals of fullness. I will try to find an enjoyable way to move my body. I will try to look kindly at my body and to treat it with love and respect. So now real quick, I'm gonna end with a shameless commercial. These are my books. And um, I would love it if you, they're, they're not about what I talked about today, but um, the, the one on the left of your screen is a clinician's guide to pathological ambivalence. It's working with clients who are ambivalent. That's what it's for. And all kinds of strategies. It's a how-to book on how to help people resolve their ambivalence. And the one on the right is if you ever get stuck in ambivalence, whether you're a therapist or not, have trouble making decisions, haven't, ha haven't achieved some goals that you know you're capable of, you feel stuck but don't understand why, this is a workbook to help you work through your own ambivalence and the two can be used um, sort of as companions to each other. All right, I'm finished. That's my content, 